Welcome to the Standard High Online Teaching. You're with Cheyune Andrew. Today we are moving into a different history paper. That is African nationalism. In 35 to date. So, the most important thing in there is the aspect of nationalism. What is nationalism? This is a big concept that is defined and explained differently by different scholars. But now when we add on the aspect of African, let us simplify it and bring it to the level of the struggle amongst Africans to attain independence. The struggles, we all know African countries were colonized. Each and every African country was colonized. Apart from a country like Liberia and Ethiopia that had survived colonial rule. Now, at first we enjoyed the policies of the colonial masters. At first we enjoyed the developments caused by the colonialists. When I talk of the colonialists, I'm referring to uh, the British. I'm looking at the French. I'm looking at the Germans, I'm looking at Spain, I'm looking at Portuguese, so many other European countries especially that took up African countries as their colonies. Now, given the oppressive and exploitative role, I told you, don't forget it, in the first years, we enjoyed the colonial policies, we enjoyed the colonialists because of the development they caused, the education they promoted, the infrastructure they caused, the roads. We loved the white man. Everywhere, the white man was loved. Up to now, by the way, we still in Africa love and cherish everything to do with European countries. Let it come to the language we use. We prefer use of the English language. Let it come to the ladies. It's not an insult. They prefer the other color of the whites as opposed to our black color. Then, even in all our styles, in our African culture, specifically in Uganda, we even have other strong saints. A sign that we still feel it is better to be in the other color than being in our African color. That shows the magnitude to which we appreciated the white man. But what is very painful, at, from 1935, Africans had totally started losing their interest and developing strong bias towards a white man. What was in the mind of Africans at that point was how to attain self-rule, how to attain independence in the political, social, and economic spheres. Now, the struggle, the consciousness to wake up and fight for independence, to wake up and struggle for self-rule is what we are calling nationalism. It comes from the word nation. The love for one is nation. But it's not only love, it equally involves the struggle to attain independence, the patriotic element, patriotism behind this. And every African country struggled to attain independence. We are calling it struggle because there is no country that woke up and just said bye-bye to Europeans who are not willing to leave African countries. It involved fights and struggles. Now, that is where we get the concept of African nationalism. In brief, the struggle to attain self-rule in the political, social, and economic spheres. It also involved expression of hostility towards the white man. Now, there are so many reasons why Africans woke up and said enough is enough. In the earlier years, don't forget, Europeans began colonizing Africa way back in 1880s. That is when European countries began picking serious interest in African countries. Some other European countries like the Portuguese came even much earlier than that. But how come we only later began waking up on a serious note in 1935? And by the way, serious struggles and armed struggles began even much later after 1945. Now, what are those reasons that made Africans to wake up, to say enough is enough? We are tired. Many people, even up to now, are undergoing oppression and exploitation. 
But you find people are still silent. They are looking at it as normal. What made Africans to wake up to say enough is enough. These are the factors we are saying. The factors for the growth and development of African nationalism. Reasons that made Africans to wake up to say enough is enough. Factors for the growth and development of African nationalism. These factors are broken into two. We have internal factors Then we have external factors. Let's bring it at a small level that everyone can easily understand. It's like developing interest in someone or developing interest in a man or a woman. It could be because of what you personally see in her or what people say about her. So we have internal factors, factors within us Africans that made us say enough is enough. Then we had factors outside Africa that equally compelled, that excited, that motivated Africans to wake up for independence. Let us, for today's lesson, concentrate on the internal factors. Factors within Africa that made Africans to fight for their independence. One. The oppressive and exploitative colonial policies. The oppressive and exploitative colonial policies. As I said in the beginning, that European colonialists or Europeans had very many developments in Africa, right from 1880s. Their policies were very many. But these policies turned out to be oppressive and exploitative. Their administrative nature, by 1935, or beyond 1935, we just could not succumb to it. We just could not tolerate it. One, they grabbed African land, and Africans became squatters. After all the fertile lands, take an example in Kenya, the Kenyan fertile lands were taken over by the whites. The slum areas, look at South Africa. The slum areas, the infertile areas, what they termed as the Bantu stands, that is where Africans were destined. All the fertile areas with the resources were taken over by the whites. The harsh colonial policies, beating up African chiefs and African leaders, denying Africans from growing cash crops, uh, you very well know, ladies and gentlemen, that however much you grow cash crops, coffee, tobacco, tea, you can never have those as the food. You cannot say lunch, we are going to have tea. Then uh, supper, we are having tobacco. Then breakfast, we are having sugar cane. You need alongside to have food crops. Africans, we are denied chance to grow food crops. And this explains famine. Then there was still brutality. Heavy taxes. Africans were heavily taxed. Africans were denied education. There were so many ugly colonial policies. There were these policies that bred hatred among Africans and compelled them to wake up and begin struggles for their independence. Next, the missionary activities. The missionaries we earlier on received across Africa, that was a blessing in one way or the other. They, among other things, promoted education. And in their education, they taught so many things to the Africans, especially the French Revolution. Because definitely, they did not teach African history. They taught European history. And the other strong topic in there was the French Revolution, which taught and introduced Africans to the idea of liberty, fraternity, and equality. These became the guiding slogans. Africans began demanding for their liberty. Among the other things the missionaries did, they even taught Africans some elementary education. Where Africans even learned some English and some bit of writing and reading, they were able to use their broken English to ask for their freedom. So the missionary activities triggered off nationalistic feelings. They taught them to love one another, but in reality, Europeans were not treating Africans the same way. 
So the many activities of the missionaries opened the minds of the Africans towards the true sense of liberty, fraternity, and equality, and they began demanding for that. Then the other thing that still compelled Africans to wake up and struggle for their independence was the rise of independent African churches. These were mainly in Ghana, in Namibia. We shall also later have cases in South Africa, among all the other countries in Africa. Now, what was this idea of independent African churches? The missionaries, the white fathers, the white clergy, at first built churches in Africa. They taught Africans religion. They preached so many things that were making Africans fall in love with the whites. But what was very painful, whatever they taught, like love your neighbor the way you love yourself, all right? It's not exactly what they practiced. Looking at what the missionaries were preaching, especially the principles of love and equality, they are not the very practices the white man was doing in Africa here. This made very many Africans hate what was being taught in the white man's church. Africans broke away and began their own churches. They felt they were tired. When you look at the way churches are mushrooming in Uganda today, some people feel they are not contented with one church. They begin their own churches. Now, this is exactly what happened among the Africans. They began their independent churches. When they began their independent churches, in these churches, they began preaching to the Africans in the very languages they understood about the need for independence, self-rule. They were now able to even use local languages to the Africans teaching them that please wake up and we fight for our rights and we fight for our independence. So the existence of independent churches greatly uh, triggered off nationalistic feelings. Let's quote one man, Bishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa, who completely, who fought throughout his life to see the true liberty of the Africans in South Africa. Then the other thing was the 1935 to 41 Italo Ethiopian crisis. The Italo Ethiopian crisis. Now, Italo from Italy. It should be remembered, ladies and gentlemen, in Africa, we had two countries that we celebrated back then, especially the fact that they were very independent. We had Italy and Ethiopia. These were the only African countries that had survived colonial rule. Incidentally, in 1935, our only pride in Africa, Italy, was, inv sorry, Ethiopia, was invaded by Italy. Ethiopia was the country that all the other Africans emulated because of the developments and how she had enjoyed her independence. She was a living symbol to all the other African countries of how it feels to be independent. When Ethiopia was attacked, it became an eye-opener to all the other African countries that Europeans still had abnormal appetite for African countries. That in, unless Africans woke up, Europeans were still very determined to swallow the entire African continent. If the only country that was independent had now been uh, uh, taken over, then it was a question of all Africans joining hands to fight the white man. Then, there is something very interesting, that in 1941, the Ethiopians, together with the support of other African countries, managed to defeat Italians. And Italians were driven out of Ethiopia. In 1941, Ethiopia finally gets back her independence. This equally inspired other African countries that if only we can fight harder, we can equally be able to attain independence. The other point that led to the growth and development of African nationalism. Oh yes, we are still on the factors for the growth and development of African nations. We had ended with the 1935 to 41 invasion of Ethiopia by Italy. We are now moving into the development of mass media. Now this mass media, it is broad. We are referring to the radio stations, the newspapers, the magazines. Now, these were partly developed by the colonialists. Although later, very many Africans also uh, developed and became part of this mass media. For example, the Accra Evening News. We had Radio Cairo, that was in Egypt. 
that was used to broadcast purely nationalistic messages of not only Egyptian nationalists, but all over, or for all the other African nationalists. We had in Uganda here newspapers like Muno, Uganda Yogera. All these newspapers and radio programs were used purely to exp uh, express or to expose the atrocities of the white man. Not only to expose the atrocities of the white man, but to call upon the Africans that we are still asleep. That please wake up. The white man does not wish us well. We can only be where we are when we have our own independence. So the newspapers, the magazines, especially Radio Cairo, the Accra Evening News, we just cannot forget our own in Uganda here, like Muno and Uganda Yogera, greatly served to sensitize the masses and to call upon it was a wake up call that please wake up and fight for your rights it should still emphasize that this mass media so much exposed the brutality of the apartheid regime in south africa something that awakened every other african to join the struggle then the other thing was the formation of political parties in africa this was still an idea that was got by the African elites that had attained some education outside Africa. We shall have a group of men we shall celebrate that got education from outside Africa. They developed the political knowledge of formation of political parties, and we had very many political parties in Africa. For example, talk of the United God Coast Convention, that was in Ghana. Talk of the African National Congress. I cannot forget our own here. UPC, Uganda People's Congress. Talk of ZANU. Talk of TANU. And so many, almost each country had a political party. But our interest in here, what was the work of these political parties? The political parties mobilized, sensitized Africans about the need for independence. They equally exposed the atrocities of the white man. They created unity amongst the Africans. They solicited for foreign assistance and military assistance, which all became very instrumental in the struggles of independence. Then the Egyptian Revolution of 1952. In 1952, Egypt rose up for true independence. The Egyptians were interested in true independence. We just cannot forget the government of Farouk, King Farouk, was kicked out by Abdul Gamel, Nasser, Anwar Sadat, and Najib. The revolution that began in 1952, no doubt within the shortest possible time, Egypt had managed to attain its full independence and autonomy. But our benefit is that when Egypt got independence, she dedicated herself to equally supporting other African countries to attain the same. Egypt set herself as a political asylum, as an asylum, as a, a free zone for all the other nationalists all over the, uh, Africa that were being hunted to come and hide in, Af in Egypt. Still, Egypt dedicated Radio Cairo, not only for Egyptian interests, but to all the other Africans to broadcast their nationalistic messages. Egypt extended financial assistance to other African countries that were still in this struggle. Egypt offered herself as the training base for very many soldiers of African armies or countries. For example, Algeria had a training base in Egypt, and this greatly helped in the nationalistic struggles. It should still be recalled that shortly after the Suez Canal crisis of 1956, all the arms and ammunition that were captured from the British and the French were supplied to other African countries to help in their struggles, like in Algeria and in South Africa. Let's slightly move to the formation of the Organization of African Unity, OAU. Now, the formation of organ rather the Organization of African Unity, that was formed in 1963 with, of course, so many aims. But let us look at basically one important aim, the idea of unity. It was formed to create unity and, most importantly, to liberate African countries from the yoke of colonialism. It could have had several other aims, but let us look at joining all Africans together and, above all, struggling to ensure that African countries attain 
independence. This organization is so much celebrated. It exposed the atrocities of the white man to the international community, especially to the UN. It became a joint voice for all the Africans to voice out their cry and to demand for independence. OAU dedicated three quarters of her annual budget to the liberation of especially South Africa. She became the mouthpiece to the South Africans that were in the struggles of dismantling apartheid. It helped in extending military assistance to so many other African countries. So the formation of OAU greatly helped in the struggles of African nationalism. Then the other idea is the 1952 to 55 Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya. Mau Mau is a brief abbreviation from the Chiswahili word that was initiated by the Kenyans, especially the Chikuyu, with an intention of having the Muzungu moving back to their country such that Africa can have total freedom. Mau Mau, that abbreviation simply meant let the white man move back to his country so that an African can attain total freedom. These were the Chikuyus rising up against the British. They were tired of the oppressive and exploitative rule of the British in Kenya. Yes, we agree this Mau Mau rebellion was not a success. The Kenyans painfully they were crushed. But we are saying even when they were crushed, the great message was sent to the British that Kenyans were tired of their oppressive and exploitative rule. They all needed their independence. And this compelled the British to begin preparing Kenya for independence. Not only Kenya, but to even prepare other East African countries, Uganda, Tanzania, for independence. That is why you realize that all these three East African countries got their independence within the same period of time. All right? So, because of the Mau Mau Rebellion. Now we move to the 1954 to 1962 Algerian War of Independence. This was led by the National Liberation Front, FLN. Okay, now we are calling it National Liberation Front. And one is wondering why we are saying it from behind. We are dealing with a Muslim country. And in their styles of writing, it begins from behind. National Liberation Front. This was led by Ahmed Ben Bella, and it was eventually a success. These ones were rising up against the French. The French in Algeria were not ready to grant independence until when an armed struggle was engineered towards the French. Thank God, in 1962, the Algerians were finally given independence. When Algeria got independence, she equally began supporting other African countries that were still in this struggle. And her independence became an inspiration to countries like Angola, all right, that were still in the struggle. Countries like Mozambique realized that it is very possible. One thing you should know, listeners, that any country that got independence left an inspirational legacy to other countries that it is very possible to get independence, just like students learning. You find last year in Standard High, senior six excelled. That is a, a, an inspiration, a motivation to the senior fives that if the other class made it, we can equally make it if only we can read harder. So the independence of Algeria became an inspiration. It motivated other countries, but most importantly, Algeria extended military and financial assistance to other African countries. Then, the other thing was the Suez Canal crisis of 1956. Now, this was a, a, a war that was fought in Egypt with an intention of liberating the Suez Canal. This was the center, the economic center of Egypt. This war saw Egypt on one hand fighting a combination of the British, the French, and the Israelites on the other hand. The Egyptians were saying, we cannot talk of total independence of Egypt when our center, our economic heart, is still being controlled by foreigners. So the foreigners were controlling the Suez Canal, and this was controlling all the trade of Egypt. 
Now, the Egyptians under Abdul Gamel Nasser, with an intention of attaining full independence, they opened up war onto these foreigners. And finally, the British and the French were defeated. Now, what were the benefits of this crisis? A lot of revenue that was initially being controlled by the foreigners was now to be controlled by Egyptians. And it was out of this revenue that other African countries that were in the struggle were given financial assistance. Still, a number of arms and ammunition that were captured after defeating the British and the French were given to other African countries that were still in the struggle. Like Algeria, at that point, she was still in the struggle. She was given a good number of arms and ammunition. Let us not forget, the finances that were captured or that were now controlled by the Egyptians greatly helped Egypt to extend scholarships to very many Africans who attained education from Egypt out of this education. These are the very nationalists we are celebrating that came back to their respective African countries and engineered nationalistic struggles. The other point we just cannot forget was the existence of independent countries in Africa. Already the existence of independent African countries. If in the village there, there exists some rich people, that is already a sign that it's possible for someone to be rich. So in Africa, we had countries that had not tested colonial rule, like Liberia and Ethiopia. This inspired because Africans were able to borrow the meaning of independence. They looked at how Liberia and Ethiopia enjoyed their independence. The developments in these countries that just could not be contested or just could not be compared to other African countries was another clear indicator that if a country is independent, these are the benefits. This inspired Africans to fight harder, to struggle day and night to equally attain independence. The role of African elites, these Africans that had attained some levels of education, especially outside Africa, almost in each and every country in Africa, we had those men that had attained education. We had Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia, we had uh, Kamuzu Banda of Malawi, we had Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. We can't forget our Milton Obote, we had Namudi Azkwe, we had very many men like Midandi Sali, among others. The elites played a greater role. They were the brains behind formation of political parties. The elites were the brains behind motivating, inspiring, mobilizing other Africans. They were the very people that received independence of those particular countries. They are the very people that formed the political parties. They are the very people who had some levels of English that would negotiate with the colonialists. They participated in several elections and they were able to at see or to drive African countries to independence. As we wind up, we can't forget the Brazzaville Conference in 1944 in Congo that was summoned or called by the French leader of that time, de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle. Now, when Charles rose to power, he called for a meeting. This meeting was for all the French colonies, and this meeting was in Congo, specifically in Brazzaville. He was more concerned with the aspect of colonialism and was more interested in granting African countries, or specifically the French colonies, independence. In this meeting, he emphasized the idea of preparing African colonies, especially French colonies, for self-rule. Because he had seen no sense of France continuously having expensive colonies in Africa. So after this meeting, in all the French colonies, they began pressing harder for independence, having realized that the leader had an idea of granting self-rule or independence. Now this inspired, especially in the French colonies, to begin working harder or struggling for independence. Just to cause a replay, that in the French colonies, all France had Tunisia, she had Morocco, she had Algeria, she had Madagascar. By then, she was called Malagasy. This made them press harder for independence because in the conference, it was agreed upon in Congo that let us begin preparing for 
independence. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, who are still enjoying Chene Andrew on this Dahiza or Standard High School Zana online teaching, our very last idea in the interest of time was the abolition of slave trade in West Africa. Whereas slave trade was abolished all over Africa, it began basically in West African countries. And people began enjoying some freedom of movement, freedom of speech, interacting with one another. This made them even begin freely discussing the idea of attaining independence. They began pressing harder. And those who that had been set free, or the independence that was enjoyed by people in West Africa, inspired even Africans or over other African areas to begin pushing harder for independence because they had at least seen others enjoy some freedom. Then we had the appetite policy among other issues. Thank you so much for listening. We shall again meet in the other lessons.